Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the Corporate Venturing Podcast of PwC. Um, I'm happy, very happy today to have um, two great people joining me today uh, to talk about a collaboration that um, makes a lot of sense, but also um, is less conventional when it comes to corporate venturing. Uh, so maybe, uh, first of all, Peter uh, van der Velde, very, very much welcome to the podcast. Hi, Elise. Thank you for having me. Uh, and we also have uh, Philippe, Philippe de Schutter, uh, CEO of The Park. Welcome as well. Hello, Elise. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Maybe, um, Peter, um, for, for our listeners who don't know 9.5 Ventures yet, um, maybe uh, we, can, we can go a bit deeper into to what you guys are and, and what kind of fund you are. Um, you're actually structured as a typical closed-end VC, uh, but your investment mandate is not at all typical or standard. Can you tell us a bit more about um, the part, the, the projects that you typically invest in? Yeah, sure. Um, you're correct, Elise. We opted for a classic VC structure uh, when we're set, setting up 9.5. So it's a closed-end fund, uh, eight years. It's managed by a, by a GP and so on. Um, but we have several distinctivenesses. Uh, versus uh, other VCs and the primary distinctive factor uh, which is also a, our investment mandate and our raison d'etre is that we only invest next to corporates uh, in so-called corporate ventures. Um, the reason why we do, do so is because we believe that the corporate can bring an accelerating factor to the venture or startup and have a de-risking factor. Um, in terms of accelerating factors, and possibly afterwards, uh, Philippe can can give his idea on it. Uh, he had in practice with the park. Uh, but accelerating factors can be faster go-to-markets, uh, IP, technology, market insights, formulations on products, and so on. And if we're talking about the de-risking factors, uh, it can be corporate experience, uh, longer runways in terms of investment, finding better management teams, uh, focus on business build, building rather than uh, than funding rounds and so on. And in the past uh, two to three years, we've been we have been iterating our methodology in terms of structuring these deals and 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 governance uh, implementation of these deals. So it became our special specialization uh, as a VC fund. And then we have other maybe secondary distinctive factors is that we're not uh, we don't have a, a spray and pray. Uh, mentality, but we only invest in a couple of startups. Uh, for this fund, it will be around eight to ten. Um, we have active investors, people who have founded companies between uh, one million and hundreds of million, and who want to support the management teams. We invest pre-seed uh, from uh, co-founding up until uh, tickets to five, seven million. Um, so I think these are the main distinctive factors. Yeah, yeah, sounds very hands-on, of course, uh, yeah. and very much involved. Um, you you just said that you also co-found um, startups. Does that then mean co-founding a venture together with a corporate from scratch? Yes, we actually have, uh, from a corporate perspective, we have three starting points. Uh, the first starting point is when we define it from scratch, the venture then together with the corporate. And this takes between two, two to four months. Uh, when we when we create the idea, as they call it, uh, but also the governance structure and the and the deal structure, um, and we do this together with the corporate and the top European venture builders. So that's one starting point. A second starting point is when the corporate already has existing initiatives, whether they are structured as business cases or business units, and that they want to externalize because they reach at a certain moment a glass ceiling within the corporate, and then they need an external VC uh, to break through that glass ceiling. And that could be by mean of an, of an external investment. So that's the second starting point. And then the third one is we get approached a lot by uh, existing startups um, who are attracting corporate uh, investors and in which the management teams of the existing startups, startups would like to have uh, an extra VC on board, which, as you might know, is not often uh, often seen uh, to have a VC investing next to a corporate. Uh, and in this case, as I said, it's our speciality. Yeah, yeah, great, very insightful. Um, maybe this is also a good moment to 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 
zoom a bit deeper into uh, what Philippe is doing with the park. Uh, I think most people uh, know about the park, but I think still Philippe uh, would be great to hear a bit more about uh, how the park came to life and, and, and what the different roles of the different actors involved were. Yes, um, so basically what the park is all about, it's, um, it's about bringing the future of entertainment, of immersive entertainment to the broad public. That is really the mission that we, we try to, to, uh, to pursue. Uh, and the way that we do it is, is by having venues uh, that we operate, just literally very physical locations in which we can really do a strong uh, CapEx investment on, hard, on the hardware side, on the technology side, to really go and, and, and look for what that future and what the strongest immersive uh, experiences can be for people. Um, for the moment, we do it by the use of virtual reality, uh, by which we uh, are going to suit up our locations with the best technology that we can find and that there is there on the market. And then uh, we will create um, IPs for it ourselves. So we're going to uh, curate our own IPs. In our case, we do it also. Uh, we, we leverage the, the, the Tilnet brand and the Tilnet uh, as a corporate with all its IP that it has, such as the mall, uh, as, which is obviously quite famous in, in Belgium, um, where we then will create a, like a, a more intimate connection with the, the fan base of the mall because at the park, they can actually be part of the experience. So, so as you come to the park, it's really a location where you roam freely, you move freely, uh, but completely in virtual reality. Okay, and you mentioned Telenet. There's a, there's a very clear link and relation with Telenet, um, but also 9.5 Ventures was involved very early on in, 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 in the process of setting up the park. Uh, could you maybe explain a bit how that went and, and, and who started with what and, and, and how the whole process looked like? Well, I, I think on, on that, uh, it's important that we start with Peter, maybe with his view, because it started with 9.5, the really in, in the, con, the concept phase of the park and where it all was. That was where, where Peter and 9.5 um, uh, really got into track. And I was only attracted at the later stage when it was really about, um, yeah, uh, actually launching uh, the concept and building a company on top of it. Mm -hmm. So maybe if, if Peter, won, I think Peter is more placed to explain. Yeah. Um, so if we go back to the inception of the park, um, and just to give you some context, uh, the, the park was the first uh, investment and actually also the first end-to-end -end track. So when I was talking about our starting points with the corporates, this was uh, starting from scratch. Um, actually, Telenet uh, was looking at the entertainment sector or industry and wanted to be involved um in that value space actually they were looking at social entertainment and they already had defined um virtual reality together with one of the belgian venture builders at that moment we stepped in and actively uh, supported the track on uh, the three levels on the definition of the venture and especially the financial aspects secondly um in getting the documentation ready and the deal structure for establishment as this was something new to Telenet too. And thirdly, and I think in this case, the most important factor was setting up the governance and finding the management team. And uh, that was also the moment when we got in contact with Philip as looking at his background, he would be the perfect person uh, to pull off an operational rollout model uh, like the park. And actually that was the moment that Philip uh, got on board. He had the first boots on the ground and um, and did a significant and a perfect roll up until now, if I can say. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for sharing that. Um, it, it's it's very um, interesting to understand the first steps of, of, of the park and how the different actors were involved, but also still today, uh, the company is backed by two investors, two main stakeholders, still dealing at a 9.5 ventures. Has the, have the roles changed? since that early days, uh, in terms of involvement, in terms of uh, what each brings to the table? Yes, definitely. Um, so so the, the, the big difference was initially, as I launched the concept, yeah, as, as Peter uh, rightfully said, it was really like first boots on the ground and I was really thrown in it. And then suddenly you have this venue and you have to launch it and it goes really fast. And in the beginning, uh, you're alone. Uh, you don't have your management team yet because it's 
as, as is the CEO, you're in the best position to, to recruit them yourself. Um, and it's at that point in time, you really need a lot of help on uh, really getting a grasp on the operation, really have uh, smart entrepreneurs uh, that have are, are shoulder by shoulder with you. Um, have people who can also advise you in the recruitment of that management team, etc. Uh, and that was really where, where 9.5 played the strongest role as really like a partner or a mentorship um, uh, role that they really put next to Telenet, who was more the accelerator um, in, in this. Telnet was actually it's basically the, the the party that would really push us forward by letting us leverage the logo of Telnet, by uh, using the channels that they have, um, by bringing us in contact with the network that they have. And 9.5, its role was really that mentorship and and really that guidance towards really becoming a, a more solid uh, solid uh, venture. And as time moves on, obviously, uh, as CEO, you, you get much more like independence and you develop a management team and you create an, a personal scope on what you, where you want to bring the company. And then 9.5 more started to shift towards really uh, a network enabling party uh, with parties like Kinepolis, for example, uh, were, for example, were, were brought into contact with us through uh, the network of 9.5. And then it allows to open doors and go faster at, at, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I think to add to that, um, the VC in this case should, should reform itself from a very active role to a supporting role. And if we're talking about corporate venturing and the acceleration the corporate could, could bring, in our opinion, it should always be on demand of the management team. And it's our role, as we call it, some kind of a gatekeeper that the corporate is not pushing anything on, uh, on, the, on the, 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 the startup. And adding to that, we should be adding uh, entrepreneurial reflexes. Uh, we should, as a gatekeeper, arm wrestle with the corporate that we not go into yearly budget cycles, we think in startup runways, um, that we should incentivize the management team correctly and not like they do in corporates. Um, and that we find, uh, these are just examples, eh, that we find a good balance between the necessary corporate reporting and an actual startup reporting. Um, and I think it's our role to get the David and Goliath thing uh, actually working and accelerating uh, rather than slowing down. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a super important role. So uh, it's, it's, it's great to see uh, that, that that's part of uh, the offering towards entrepreneurs, of course. Um, maybe, um, Philippe, we've, we've seen a few things in the newspaper lately. Um, I think the park is, is growing at a remarkable pace uh, with, with multiple venues today and, and still opening. Uh, but I understand that the idea is not to limit this just to Belgium, right? No, 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 not at all. Um, the Growing and, and really scale is at the core of the business model of what the park is. Um, because we really want to bring um, those immersive entertainment towards the broad public. Uh, so not to, to clearly distinguish from, from gaming, as we say. So, so it's really like an immersive form of the mall, of the DAG, of, of other experiences. So that means that we have to create them ourselves, which also means that and that comes to a really, really great cost. Uh, so that also means that we ne really need to grow as much as we can in order to reduce the leverage cost of production. Basically, um, and Belgium is just not, not. If you really want to bring the best of those experience towards the broad public, Belgium is just not big enough. Um, so, so we are not only we are ambitious, obviously. So we want to grow as fast as we can, and we always will. Uh, but so we also need to grow. And in order to um, to be fun, to 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 leverage our IP, our first step was to start looking to the Netherlands, which we did. So we launched two venues uh, in. Breda and in Eindhoven uh, past September. Um, but since we, we see the success over there and with that we got international interest, uh, both from the US, from Switzerland, but also from other countries like France, um, we started to uh, realize that maybe in the next phase, it's even more interesting to start and looking at more relevant uh, international IP uh, to start uh, starting developing uh, maybe titles like and 
it's not that it's the case, but but maybe that it's like maybe the Godfather, maybe uh, things as as Mission Impossible, maybe those kinds of, of bigger IP that are now things that becoming uh, that come into our, into our scope. Yeah, and like most telecom and, and entertainment uh, providers, Telenet is quite locally anchored. Um, how? Um, what does that mean for the international expansion? Will they play a role? Are you looking for new partners? Uh, is it? Um, yeah. How? How do you see your, their role evolving in that international expansion? Yeah, it's true, and it's it's really to that extent. It's really interesting to to see a corporate like Telenet um, really standing behind an international expansion, which is obviously not really not the, their their kind of space. Um, but as I said before, since our, our goal is to bring the strongest uh, immersive experience towards the people, Telnet has all the benefits also on a local, locally, uh, only in Flanders, uh, to, have, to make sure that we are as big as we can in order to, make the biggest, to bring the biggest experience towards the, the Flemish customers as well. But Telnet really sees the park as a, an international venture, as a success story that they really want to build and that they want to support more than just a component of uh, some marketing gimmick that we would like to, to offer to, to, the, to the Flanders customers. And the fact that, for example, that we have the recent partnership with Kinepolis is, is a very clear, um, uh, uh, is, is a clear example of, of what that push uh, would be like. So, so, for example, for Kinepolis, we make a lot of sense as well because we, we immerse their customers in a more interactive and in a, in a completely in a different way into a similar IP. Like for example, we also launched the, the movie of Cadri, uh, where we created the immersive experience of it. And then you also see Telnet really being very open to, to discuss with, with Kedipolis what is more strategic partnership could maybe be in the future. It's not the case. We're not, at the moment we, we, we to Kinepolis is, is, a, is a strategic partner as we are, but in the future we are open to, to look at, at, at other parties who would maybe be involved uh, in, in, in the equity structure of, of the park. No one is against this. We will be seen case by case. I can imagine that uh, international expansion is also quite capital intensive. Um, so, so you would be also looking towards other parties uh, to invest, or, or Peter, do you, do you feel like you want to limit the the for for nine point five ventures? You want to limit the cap table and, and and stick to the two original investors? Mm. Well, on on the first question, if 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 we look on uh, further capital increases. From our opinion, we're looking at a very interesting business case. It's proving itself in the market. Uh, we have an exceptional performing team. Um, there is a successful execution of the acceleration of the corporate. Uh, we're looking at uh, fast scalability. So all this is positive and we are happy to have been supporting the company and are willing to support it. Whether if this is going to be with a third partner on board or not, that's completely open. Um, it's just something we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And of course, as a closed end I, fund, I'm, I'm, yeah, go ahead, Philip. <laughs> I'm sorry, and I just that I would like to add to it that uh, for the park and also for for the the international expansion that that we are doing, yes, it is capital in, uh, intensive. But if there would be other parties involved, the the, the big leverage that we get from a party like nine point five and like Tillet, that it's not going to be because of the cash need that we will take another party on board. Um, both parties are, are decently, uh, are very strong, uh, are very strong partners. So it's not, not going to be just a cash. It's going to be an, a strategic partner that will allow us, allow us to go even faster or become even better or internationally relevant. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense, of course, yeah. Um, maybe, um, Peter, you, you explained in the beginning that, that you're a closed-end fund. So, um, all closed end funds must sometimes come to an end. Um, and I think in, in this case, intuitively, um, I, I would say maybe the exit strategy is, is clear that the idea is to sell to Telenet, especially since at the moment it's the only uh, party in the cap table. Is that the case? And is that the case for every venture or not necessarily? Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's one of the most common misconceptions and questions we get. In every meeting we have with the corporates, it's the first question too. Um, and to answer it, I'd like to take a step back. 
first of all, we're a VC firm. And as a VC firm, you have the target to give a return to your investors. In our case, as you know, we, we're a 35 million euro fund. Um, so at a certain moment, we have to exit. And normally, in every occasion, we should always reach as close as possible to fair market value uh, in terms of exiting the startups. Um, any prearranged exit classes or exit parties would vary or would be very restrictive on that fair market value. So we try to avoid it. Um, in general, we see three possible exits. Uh, or it's a joint exit together with the corporate to a bigger party or whatever. Or it's a partial exit of 9.5 to, at that moment in time, a stronger party which could scale the park in this case. Or it's an, it's an exit to the corporate. And already early in the, in the deal structuring process, we want to see in which directions the corporate is aiming at. And then case by case, we're going to set up the deal structure in that direction. But our premise is always to get as close as possible to fair market value. And this was yeah. also in the case of the park and Telenet. Yeah, yeah, of course. Great. Um, I see that uh, we're, we're nearing towards the, the, the 30 minute mark. Um, so, so maybe um, a few closing questions. Um, first of all, um, I, I think what we also see with our corporate clients, a lot of our corporate clients have, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, been thinking about their strategy, mainly about changing consumer behavior, but also um, changing internal processes um, to respond to new safety requirements or to uh, respond to um, need for cost optimization. Uh, but then on the other hand, also um, the COVID pandemic uh, drove a lot of corporates to uh, cut costs. Um, do you think, uh, Peter, that the golden age of corporate venturing is still ahead of us? Or do you think uh, because of the recent pandemic, um, we will see corporates being more careful in uh, spending on uh, open innovation? Um, well, uh, I believe that corporate venturing also in the past decades has always been very uh, important and will be so in the upcoming years. Um, I do see, and I, I actually don't know if there's going to be an impact of COVID on accelerating corporate venturing in general or not. But I do believe that um, there is a golden age upcoming and that we're really in this peer point and paving the way of VCs working together with corporates. And this is something completely new. And I, at least in Europe, we're one of the first funds who are proactively looking for corporates to co-invest. Um, and the reason why is established companies, they have spent in the last years enormous energy and money in uh, setting up innovation tracks, corporate venturing tracks, and so on. And post-COVID, there's a huge shift in coming from ideation towards valorization. And to be able to valorize on that energy and money they have spent, they might use uh, the knowledge and the speed of VCs to get into something really sizable businesses and to get through that glass ceiling I mentioned in the beginning. Um, and actually our, our antennas in the, in the European corporates, uh, they confirm this. Uh, first of all, a lot of corporates are attracted to our model. Uh, secondly, we see, we see a lot of um, interesting articles popping up on, for instance, um, VBOs, venture buyouts, uh, this is where actually VCs buy corporate ventures and spin them out. Uh, so we see a lot of movement uh, in or towards the direction that VCs are starting to work with, with corporates. And personally, this would be, for, at least for us, the golden age uh, mm -hmm. in terms of corporate venture. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, maybe, Philippe, um, as, as a CEO of a company that has very close ties with uh, a partnering uh, corporate. Is there any um, lessons learned or tips that you could share with other founders looking uh, for, um, yeah, such setups for their their company? Um, I, th I think there's just two things. I think for for people who would um, be at a point to launch uh, a venue, 
um, from from my perspective, it would really be to really leverage those parties to get to take your time to take really to take all the time that you need in order to really um, uh, find your your ideal management team to pull it off uh, and not just go for 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 fast successes, but really like start with building a team uh, before you start building the venture. Um, secondly, I think for existing uh, existing startups or existing parties maybe who are open who are starting to reflect on maybe a corporate involvement, um, I, I really would advise not to see corporates as um, future um, at future competitors or as like the enemy that they want to break or, 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 or in, in the coming future by innovation, but really see them as an enabling party. Um, th there's so much that a corporate can bring in terms of network, in terms of uh, knowledge, quality, um, market entries, data, just you name it, that if, if people stop seeing them it's just as the competition that you want to disrupt uh, but more as parties that will enable you to create a future together that there is is a very important mindset uh, and i think that's also the same for corporates not to be afraid of those startups who are disruptive etc because there's this very strong enabling factor they can offer each other yeah so basically disrupting the industry together instead of trying to disrupt um more traditional business models only uh, with, with with the corporates as competitors. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, really. Yeah, grow grow for the sake of bringing value to to the customers in the end, and not for the sake of competing with someone. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot to both of you for sharing your uh, expertise, knowledge, insights with us, and then uh, I uh, wish you all um, yeah a good rest of the day. I guess uh, Philippe, busy times are are. Uh, coming with uh, the reopening of uh, inside activities and also the international expansion. So I think you're quite busy. <laughs> we are pretty busy, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.